Okay, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our second seminar, uh, the CSE series. Um, so today is a pleasure to have here uh, Professor Michael Brenner. He's at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard, and also at the Professor of Physics. So uh, Michael got his PhD in the University of Chicago. Uh, and then if I'm not mistaken, you came to MIT, to, uh, to the math department for some yeah, time. I was here. Until you then moved in 2002 to, the, to Harvard. So he works mostly on the modeling of physical systems. He has one different uh, type of applications like materials and free mechanics, like a topic very dear to me. And I think that today you are gonna talk about something related to free mechanics uh, and also how to use, uh, solve things for partial differential equations that they appear a lot in these physical systems and how to blend that with machine learning. So without further ado, yes, uh, go ahead. Cool, cool, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always nice to come and talk at MIT. But I might, but as it, this is, I don't know about all of you, probably listening to speakers in person is disconcerting. This is the first talk in person I've given since February 2020. Well, other than to students on a Blackboard, um, which actually I've been doing lately, but I don't know. So this is really exciting. I don't know how this will go because I haven't, uh, anyway. Um, I mean, I don't know, like the Zoom banner, for example, that all of you in the room see, because I guess most of the people are online. I've been, I don't know about all of you, but I've been fighting with this in talks on my computer for a year and a half. So you can fight with me. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a research program that we've been carrying out for a couple of years, essentially trying to accelerate and understand, although today I'm only really gonna talk about accelerate, the solutions of partial differential equations like those in fluid mechanics using machine learning. And one thing about this talk to say is that the goal of this research program, I'll, I'll motivate this a little bit more as we go on, but just as a high level, because there's a lot of work um, in this field, our goal is to use as little machine learning as possible. Like we're, that is, that is but, but it's asked the question by using only very, very, very sparing amounts, can one actually make a performance difference in solving PDs? And that's really what we've, well, that's, that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And so the work that I'm gonna tell you about has been done by a large group of people, mainly at Google, um, where we have a group working on this. So the, the part, the second part of the talk, which I think is the most interesting part, it's the, um, it's the most recent part anyway, and, and it starts to show, it was really done by these three people, Stefan Hoyer, Dean Makoshkov, and Jamie Smith, who are at Google. Um, the, the original idea for the, that I'm gonna describe was done by a former postdoc at Harvard, Yohai Barsanai, who's now a professor in Tel Aviv. And then there have been a bunch of other people who have helped in various ways. And I just wanna make sure to put that up at the beginning. Um, I guess the other thing I, I wanna say is that, um, and now I'm blocking, so let's see, this is the fun of Zoom. Um, so um, the other thing I wanna say is that I, I'm going to make no effort in this talk to be scholarly um, with apologies to the community. Like there's a ton of really interesting work in this field. And, but what I wanna do just in the interest of sparking discussion is just explain the way we've been thinking about this, but I don't, so you're supposed to be scholarly when you give talks, I would like to acknowledge that, but I'm just not going to right now, but I'm happy to take questions and discuss whatever you uh, want. So, okay, so first brief introduction, which you, you don't need. So, but just to say, so, I mean, partial differential equations, of course, pervade the physical sciences. What we always tell our students and what I still tell my students is that, you know, we first you solve ODEs and then you solve more ODEs and then you get to PDEs where there's an ODE at every point in space. So the PDEs have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. That's what we tell them. And, but then what we all know is that we can't solve an infinite number of degrees of freedom. We can't solve them computationally. And we also can't understand them. And we also know that, that for a typical setting, even a very complicated one, any dynamical system is finite dimensional somehow. There's some parameterization of the solution manifold, whatever it is where it's finite dimensional. And I would argue that if you look at applied mathematics as a subject in the 20th century, the main accomplishment or one of the main accomplishments, I guess there were several, information theory, anyway, but anyway, the, but other um, uh, accomplishment, but main accomplishment was like trying to figure out how to parameterize complex solution manifolds in a way that both made sense and was computationally efficient. And that, that's been a major goal. But the thing is, is that this hasn't really, I think we have to be honest though, and say that this hasn't really worked very well. And what I mean by that is, I mean, th these movies, I don't even care if they play, it doesn't matter, um, maybe they'll play. Um, but, but, but I mean, if you look at any reasonable flow of any reasonable complexity, for example, 
example. So this thing on the left, if it ever plays, is a, is a NASA simulation of the weather season in 2017. And the one on the right is some is a simulation from somebody at the DF, the fluid mechanics meeting on Raleigh Bernard convection. And basically the situation is, is that the number of grid points that is required to, to resolve, to even to attempt to resolve complex situations is 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 extremely large and it has and the, the scaling is brutal basically the scaling the computational cost scales you know at least like one over the mesh spacing to the fourth power um, three dimensions plus some time step constraint and this has been historically the major reason that we have supercomputers so you all don't need this introduction but i just want to just to, sorry just bear with me for a second because i just want to set up the line of thinking that goes with this so i mean and of course the way we solve pdes on the computer on a computer is we discretize them and we discretize them by writing down finite difference for example approximations to derivatives or you can use whatever fancy method you want i don't care but at the end of the day we reduce the pde to a set of odes and then See, this is the fun with it. I hope you're all, this is much better. I feel like I'm sharing. So those of you on Zoom can't see this, but like I'm moving this damn bar up and down, which is what happens. And, then, and, every, and so then you, know, you have a set of ODEs. And then at the end of the day, we end up with a discrete update rule. So there's an update rule. I mean, this is essentially, and the update rule um, basically specifies the field, whatever it is at the N plus first time step in terms of the, the previous time steps and, you know, rolling it out gives the dynamics. And actually, I first learned, so I, when I got to MIT as an assistant professor a long time ago, I, well, actually like Peko, Peck and I learned about deriving update rules from the same person. And I never read anything. This person just told me everything. And then I got here and I, they told me to teach this. How do you derive such update rules? That was my first teaching assignment. And I, I, um, and I was like, but I, I, everything I learned was from this person and I couldn't find it written down anywhere, but um, it was just kind of bad. But anyway, as you know, there's fields that basically derive update rules um, for this. And it's an active area of research. Now, but the thing is, is that despite, you know, basically, oh shoot, here we go. Despite, you know, decades of investment, we actually can't afford to resolve even simple situations if we want to fully resolve, which, you, you know, we can argue about whether you want to do that and why would you want to, but that's a separate discussion. So let's just suppose that we want to, which I, I think it's not a bad argument, then, you know, if you consider sort of, you know, turbulent flow, for example, which I think, you know, I also love turbulent flow, but it's only an example of this problem. If you consider turbulent flow and you just count the number of Kolmogorov eddies in a box, you know, here's my box of size L, this is the smallest eddy scale, it scales, according to Kolmogorov, like Reynolds numbers to nine quarters. And if you just say that every grid box needs, you know, 10 points in each direction to resolve it, which admittedly is too much, but fine, say three points in each direction to resolve it, whatever you want, then you immediately end up with a formula basically for the total number of grid points, which even for like a baseball pitch, you run into trouble, basically. It's kind of insane. And the, the, and I guess what I find insane about this, and I think it's important, you know, you, you guys have this computational science institute, there's a building, you know, across the street, you've got a hole in the ground, it's going up. This has been a problem for 100, no, not 100, 80, 80 years. And I will bet you that in 80 years, none of us will be here and it will still be a problem, basically, because the scaling is just impossible. And so we have to figure out what to do about this. Like we as a community, I mean, we, we can't, and I mean, of course, we as a community have struggled with this in the past. It's a very well studied problem. I mean, it has consequences. I mean, for example, you know, this is a picture of a hurricane and this is the resolution. Actually, I'll just use my pointer. This is a resolution. This is the, this is the, the grid box size in a state-of-the-art weather model. And I mean, there's no hope of convergence, basically. There's a lot of physics going on inside of the, of the of the of these boxes and at least the question that i'm still interested in is whether to what extent are the errors in the simulation a result of our inability to to to, to resolve and of course this is studied by you know but but these are still important questions so um and the other thing to say is that on the other hand, putting on an applied mathematician hat, we know that this is a terrible way to parameterize solutions. Like, it's just terrible because, you know, you're just putting down grid points and resolving. And we know that there's a finite number of degrees of freedom. We know, I mean, you can count the finite number of degrees of freedom by the number of Kolmogorov eddies, treating every eddy as independent, but we know there are correlations in the system which reduce it further. And, you know, there are mathematician friends who, you know, spend their lives deriving bounds on the, the, the actual dimension of the of what the attractors are. And the point is, is that even if we knew, if, even if we ha knew what the minimal set, we have absolutely no idea how to parameterize them um, in a way that is computationally efficient. And so, 
So the um, and, and so there just seems like there's an opportunity, and this is what gave rise to this research program. Is the question is, oh, wait, one more thing to say. Um, so I mean, you know, what the question is, can we use machine learning? And I'll explain exactly what I mean by that um, in a way to better solve equations. And the argument would be that that you know um, there are patterns and solutions, and um, and because there are patterns, if we can learn to exploit them. Um, in a way that maintains the generalizability that is inherent in classical numerical methods. Because you see, we must remind ourselves, the beauty of classical numerical methods are that we teach one, I don't know if it still exists here, but the class that I taught, which I forgot the number, it was in the math department, right? Like you taught methods and it didn't matter what PDE you were solving. We give you advice for all PDEs, right? You simply follow this algorithm, you get the update rule. So you may need to take a hit and derive update rules that are equation specific. Um, and you, you, you know, so you don't, we lose some of this general, but we still have at least generalizability within the equation. And, and the notion is, is whether or not it's possible using today's methods to find out how to do that. So, so that's, the, um, that's the idea. Um, and I'm gonna, um, I'll skip the other introduction so I can talk. And I'm gonna, um, so what I'm gonna do um, in this talk is two things. So first I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna tell you the main idea, which is in a paper that we wrote in 2019, which is on simple 1D examples, which is just motivated to explain the algorithm. And to, at the time we were trying to figure out if it was, if there was any sanity to it. And then what I'm gonna, what we've been doing since then is we've been trying to scale this up to large problems. And, you know, to, to, um, and, and the, the, the sort of latest point where we are is a paper that actually has now been published in PNAS um, in um, the spring, a couple of months ago on 2D turbulence. Um, and, uh, and, that, and I think what I'm gonna do in this talk is talk about this and talk about this, and I'll skip other things. And that's, so that's my introduction. So does anybody, before I, I'm now going to change and actually start to, does anybody have anything to say? Do we ask questions? How does this work? Are we? Wait, so if we have questions. Uh, oh, then we have to. Okay, if you're okay asking questions during the talk, then like, you have to let me know if you have to yes, I put the microphone. Oh, and I guess then we have to, we also, somebody has to modify the chat. Anyway, what do you, what do you want to yeah, do? So I prefer at the end. I okay. There is some very pressing, pressing questions. Okay. Any pressing questions? Okay, I think we can look at the chat. Oh, she is. This. No, no, okay, we're okay. Okay, so um, so this research program, the, the sort of specific instantiation that I'm gonna describe was inspired by a conversation that I had with Payman Millenfar at Google um, in, around, in 2019. So Payman um, is, a, is an expert in computer vision and his group um, has been, he's been working for years on image super resolution. So the image super resolution problem is basically where what you do is you take an image and you, you, instead of storing it at full resolution, you downscale it in some way. And then you ask, can I find an algorithm to upscale the image back to its original image? And so, um, and so what Payman sort of invented this method, which I think is really awesome called Razor, and it inspired much of our thinking in this, in which what he said was that he was going to, I mean, of course, the simplest way to do it is to just interpolate, right? Like you downscale and then you like take cubic splines or whatever your favorite interpolant is and you use those to upscale. But if you do that, then you lose sharpness in the image. This is a well-known phenomenon. And so what Payman did was to say, okay, what I'm going to do is take lots of little boxes in the image, like lots of little squares, and I'm going to, in every little square, measure the properties of the image by computing the Hessian and looking at the eigenvalues, for example. And then I'm going to learn a filter that I will use for interpolate, for upscaling. I will, and I will do it in a way that is specific to the, um, to, the, to the pattern that I'm in. And this is a method that he calls Razor. And by doing this, the performance went up enormously. And so when he showed this to me, I sort of said like, that's amazing, but it would it'd be much easier to do this on PDEs. Because, so the thing is, is that, I mean, so payment is doing this on consumer images. I don't know, please, please, you know, work on the space of images of the world. Like that's a hard problem. PDEs, if you're interested in the Navier-Stokes equations, as complicated as they are, the solution manifold is finite dimensional. See my last point. So you should be able, it should be a better um, thing. At least this was the thought to parameterize it. And, um, and, and so, so, so that's kind of what we set out to do. Now, super resolution, image super resolution actually is a large field and sort of another version of this is that people use neural networks to do this. Payment actually 
group did not use neural networks and um, Razor doesn't, it's this filter bank, which is really elegant because it's faster actually, because you don't actually have to. And, um, and I, I think, so the method I'm gonna talk about today is uses neural networks. And I think Payman is rightfully still annoyed with me for doing that. But the, the reason is, is that it's just so convenient to experiment with that um, it's hard not to start there. But anyway, we can talk about that at the end. So, okay, so here's, here's the idea of what we're gonna do. So imagine somebody gives you a bunch of curves and tells you their solutions to a PDE and then says, well, well, what I wanna do is advance this numerically. So what do you do? So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to choose grid points. And so I've purposefully chosen grid points so that the mesh is sparse. And then you're supposed to erase the curve and then what you're supposed to do is advance the equation. Now, since the equation has derivatives in it, then what that means is that you need to know the derivative of the function at every point, uh, at every mesh point in order to advance it. And so the sort of canonical way to do that is to use some sort of interpolation to do that. And when you use interpolation, if you don't use a lot of points, then the whole reason we need high resolution is because there are then errors in the, in the derivative. Right, and that's this is the whole problem, right? That of, of what, and this is why basically, in you, you know, you have to resolve very finely in space, and you also, by the way, have to resolve finely in time because there are time step constraints in these rollouts that come from things that have nothing to do with the physics. That I don't know about you, but they've always annoyed me because I would like to take a time step that is related to the phenomenon that I'm interested in, not one that's much smaller because there's some crazy phenomenon that I don't care about that I can't let contaminate the thing that I'm looking at. It just always seemed inelegant. To me. And so, um, so anyway, so, okay, suppose that I tell you, as maybe you guessed, well, I don't know, for those of you who have met me before, you might've guessed, these curves were actually solutions to Berger's equation. And so if they were solutions to Berger's equation, here's another thing you could do. You could make a library of solutions to Berger's equation. So here they are. Um, these are and we all know, you know, those of us who've spent our lives studying Berger's equation, we all know what it looks like. There are these steps. And so then I tell you, listen, can you please tell me how to interpolate these dots, given that I've told you that like, it kind of looks like this. So now it's much easier. You would never use polynomial interpolation. Like you would fit to Tanches or something. And then you're gonna do much better. Now, of course, you could do this by hand, but you can't, but that doesn't generalize. So another thing you could do is just teach a computer to do it. You could sort of train a regression algorithm to, um, to basically, um, to take this as data and to figure out how to compute the, the interpolant or the derivatives or whatever you want based on this. And then of course you get it perfectly. It only works for dots that are solutions to Berger's equation. You've now destroyed the first tenet in the numerical analysis book that you know, these are, consider a general continuous function. We're not doing that anymore, but, we've, but, but on the other hand, we don't need to resolve it. And so, so this was the idea to sort of build numerical methods around this idea. And, um, and I guess what I should say is that, so this is, we're taking a hit in proceeding this way in that at least as currently formulated, the, the methods are equation specific. But on the other hand, what I would say in defense of that is that we actually only care about a couple of equations. I think that's even at MIT. I think if you take the whole of MIT and you take a list of all the equations people care about, it's not gonna be that long. And so actually if we had methods that worked for those, that would be pretty great for engineering. So, okay, so, um, ah, zoom, okay. So, um, Anyway, so I wanna um, explain the prediction problem that we're gonna solve. So I have here a simulation of a scalar in a turbulent flow. And um, this, the, the picture on the left is a high resolution simulation. The picture on the right is an exact coarse graining. So what I mean is I'm using a mesh, which is smaller, which, is, which has bigger mesh points. I mean, you can see them because you see the granularity. And what I've done is I've taken the average of the exact solution in that mesh at every point in time. And so the thing, what I would like to do and this is what we're gonna talk about in this talk, is I would like to solve the PDE on the coarse mesh. So that is, and I would like it to be able to time step in time, and I, I would like it to agree with the exact solution as averaged on the coarse mesh. So there's another question that you could ask that I'm not gonna discuss, which is if you're given the exact solution on the coarse mesh, how would you discover the high resolution solution? But I actually, that's much easier question than, than what I'm gonna talk about, which is please now forget the high resolution simulation and only simulate on the coarse mesh. So that's the problem. Now, classically, um, that's been very hard. And the reason that this is hard is the following, is that if you take classical numerical methods and do this, then there are sort of two things that happen. Either the you use sort of a standard finite volume method and it just blows up on this mesh. This is a thing, you start with some initial condition, you let it go, or basically you over dissipate and the thing changes. And so the question is, is can we discover algorithms that avoid these 
properties. Okay, so how do we do this? So this is the, the idea, it's a very simple. And like I said at the beginning, the goal of this was to use as little machine learning as possible, but still to use enough. And so all we're gonna do, um, at the end of the talk, I will break this somewhat, but, but all we're gonna do for right now is, um, is to learn interpolation. So I'm gonna just take the interpolation rule that we're using to compute the derivatives. And so standard rule is that, you know, you have the U at a set of mesh points, right? And you, um, and you then, you know, have some range, some range of points that you're using to compute the derivative. And then you use calculus or finite, you know, element, Galerkin projection, whatever makes you happy to discover the alphas. And you then basically, you know, this is what we teach in numerical analysis. This, how do you derive these formulas? So what we're going to do instead is we're going to take the same U's and we're going to basically put in a neural network, which basically takes the U's and some range as input. And then it predicts the alphas, which then computes the derivatives. And we are then going to train it so that basically it is able to do stable rollouts on coarse meshes where the methods would usually break. That's what we're going to do. So that, um, so, okay. So how does this work? So this then requires, so there's a, so now there's an interesting trade-off. So what we're going to do is we're going to perform high resolution simulations of small pieces of a solution. Like we only, we don't actually have to simulate the whole thing anymore. We just have to do high resolution. And we're going to then learn about these interpolants. And then we are going to use them on much larger things. And we are going to check if actually this works and is generalizable enough to count as a numerical method as opposed to a memorization tool. And so this is, this is what I meant by as little as I, as I meant. So, okay, so just sort of to say it one more time. So we take the velocity of the mesh point, shoot this as C's instead of alphas. And then oh shoot, what we do to train this, so I maybe I did the comment of training is, as a matter of practice, we, what I'm gonna show you today anyway is only about finite volume methods, which is the way that we started doing this. We, the way that we do this is we take these derivatives and we use them to compute fluxes. We then basically it, you know, enforce conservation in the in the equation by writing it in a um, in a flux form, and we roll it out. And then when we train the thing, then what we do is we predict, and then we have a loss where we take the 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 the, the exact average, right? Um, and we and, and we have a mean squared error loss of some sort that's rolled out for some number of steps. I will talk about this a little bit. And then once you've trained it, you then basically take a new initial condition or a better, a new situation, and you just run the thing this way. Now, of course, in doing so, there is a cost that is incurred, which is, is very important, which is how much it costs to compute because you've sucked this damn neural network in the thing, which is if you've slowed it down, you've completely destroyed my point. So, and I will discuss that at the end and the scaling here. So, okay, so just to give you an example of what happens when you do this on Berger's equation. So this is the finite derivative operator that was learned for a coarse mesh in Berger's equation. And so what you see is that this is the first derivative operator. So, you know, it's a, and, and this is a, a one, two, three, four, five, six point stencil. So, you know, for smooth parts of the solution, it's basically doing what you would expect from a finite difference operator. But the point is, is that in the middle of the shock, it actually adopts a different, it, it's slightly different, basically. And it, and it does so in a solution dependent fashion. So, Anyway, um, this works. I don't, maybe I don't want to belabor this because this is kind of a stupid problem. But the, the baseline, so this is a, um, so this is a, um, the, the blue curve is the, is the exact solution. The red, um, the, the dots here are, a, um, are the baseline, are a baseline method, um, which basically just destabilizes even at the resolution shown. Whereas on the right, there's the neural network with only 16 points, which tracks it pretty well. And you know, if you do this more carefully, then um, then you, 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 you know it, it's quite accurate. I'm going to save the actual quantitative part of this for talking about turbulence because I think that's just so much more interesting. But just to sort of give some illustration, so what we did here is we have a solution of Berger's equation in a box of size 20 pi, and we trained in a box of size 2 pi, and this is a a, a, a rollout of the solution over 100. Um, we've basically then, we've trained a model that is 32 times, the mesh is 32 times that that was used in the baseline. Um, it was trained only here, and we then roll it out on the entire domain. We then, when we measure error, what we do is we pick a time. You, you have to, these solutions are chaotic, so you have to pick a time. If you're beyond a Lyapunov, you know, a couple of Lyapunov times, then there will be drift in the, in the solution just because there's sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So for this, it's, it's somewhere around here, 15 is a couple of Lyapunov times. So we then define a loss, which is essentially the L2 error on this box over the larger domain that it was trained and, and see how well one does. 
And if you plot the sort of mean absolute error defined by that loss as a function of the resample factor, which is how much, bit, you know, how much smaller the mesh spacing is doing, this is our algorithm. This, these are a first order method. This is the third order method. This is the Wino method, which is the way to, um, uh, this is the Wino method, um, and um, which is the state of the art method, which, which actually does use rules that were carefully constructed for taking the derivatives. And so the neural network beats the weighted method, but actually more interesting perhaps, even more interesting is that we, if we demand that our stencils um, obey the same constraints as we know, um, so we don't let them to vary willy-nilly, then we actually recover a method which basically matches the performance of we know. And what's interesting about that is it didn't require, it was just gradient descent on a loss function, right? That is, it didn't require um, so much work. So, okay, so then you're like, well, what did it do? And so you can sort of convince yourself, let me go quickly through this part. The model learns upwinding, um, you know, um, so there's upwinding in the model. Um, and, um, and then in this first paper, we tried it on a bunch of 1D equations and kind of the same story held. So, okay, so that's basically, that was our proof of concept that this was not insane. Um, if, um, if anyone is interested in playing with code, I'll give you a couple of places to play with code. So um, there's a um, graduate student at Harvard named Zhao Wei Zhuang who spent a summer as an intern at Google. And he, he started, when he came, he decided I'm gonna do this on this most trivial problem, the advection, just the advection operator. And so he started out with a step. And of course, we all know the, the trials and tribulations of that. And basically he, he showed that basically that by training a model this way, then it would maintain the shape of the step over over, over you know, much longer things. And Zhao Wei actually, there's a sort of GitHub page with a nice tutorial collab with that. Anyway, I can send people the link if you can't find it that, um, that, um, that I think is pretty clear. And I, for example, have used for teaching. Okay, so that's that. So now what I wanna do, I'm gonna skip this. This was, a, sorry, I should have deleted this. Um, okay, turbulence. So I now wanna move to turbulence. The, the part that I just deleted was advection of a scalar in a turbulent flow, which is interesting, but is easier than turbulence. So let's forget it for the moment. Okay, so to really make this win, to really make this interesting, then um, we need to do this for a problem like a turbulent flow in a complicated domain and show an actual speed up, an actual wall clock speed up. Otherwise, this is all nonsense, basically. So, okay, so what we seek, and so I guess I want to point out that this method, the methods that I'm describing here, this method of trying to, to upscale the mesh and create something that is getting the exact average in the thing is different than the sorts of turbulent closures or turbulence models that have been discussed in the past, which use phenomenology to deal with the upscaling. So like there's this notion of eddy viscosity where one says, oh, I'm not resolving the small scales. Kolmogorov said X, therefore I will replace the small scales with the viscosity and I have a new equation, which is effectively just a new update rule for the equation. I mean, you can view it as we're all just inventing update rules. So, but what we're talking about doing is very different. We're trying to, in this instantiation, match exactly. Um, and I guess one of the points that I just wanna observe under the hood with this whole thing is, and this is, I think, well, this is one of the reasons I've gotten so excited about using essentially machine learning technology to do this sort of thing is that, there is the sky is your limit as to what you would like to demand your method to do, right? Like this is only one thing that you could demand your method to do. I mean, there are lots of other interesting things that you might want your method to do. And so, and this is, and I mean, we basically now have the technology to do this. And so I think it's really exciting. Anyway, so, okay, so we seek an update rule and this is a different type of solver than those previously expressed in computational fluid dynamics. And in particular, like typically there's what people call, for example, large eddy simulation models um, which you know have effective viscosities in them. And when, if you look at sort of sort of the comparisons of the performance of large eddy simulation models, then you know up to the present day, this is an old comparison from um, you know you know from 20 years ago. But up to the present day, the comparisons are statistical. People check that the that the Kolmogorov spectra, that the spectra are preserved correctly by the codes. But of course, what we really care or you might care about is the actual field with phase information that spectra don't have, and that is, is not, that, and that is what we're trying to go after here. So, okay, so we now need to derive update rules. So that's the game. How are we gonna derive update rules? And I now wanna just take a step back and generalize a bit. And this kind of connects this way of thinking a little bit more to the literature. So one thing you could do is you could say, let's forget the equation. 
I have data. The equation is only important because it's generated data that I will use to train my update rule. And so you could basically have a pure machine learned update rule. You could just stick a neural network in there and take the data and learn that as an update rule. That's a perfectly rational thing to do. Now, when you do that though, you have to remember that the reason that we love the laws of physics is because if you actually solve them correctly, then if the experiment disagrees with it, then the experiment is wrong. And this is something that it's very hard. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are machine learning experts in the room. It's very hard. The, the, the generalization, that this is a form, you win the Nobel Prize. Here, how about that? That's generalization. If you show a disagreement, basically, right? And so, and you, you've clearly lost that if you do this because you've, you've only learned the patterns in your training data. You haven't learned the mechanisms that are inherent in this. So, okay, so then there's the, so what we're trying to do again, this gets to my as little as possible. So from the best I can tell, there are two ways to put in as little machine learning as possible. There may be more. These are the two ways that we've been thinking about. So one way is what I told you already, which is you put the input field in and you then interpolate it with, with some sort of, I'm just gonna call it neural network, but it doesn't have to be. It could be, you know, payments, Razor filter bank. I don't really care what this is. And then you take that and you stick it into the equations of motion, which you then use to roll out. So that's one way of doing it. Um, so it's kind of a pre-processing step. Um, and actually, for the turbulence thing that I'm about to show you, what, this is what we call learned discretizations. And this is the algorithm that we use. Um, we basically have a pre-processing step. We project the um, we demand that the, remember the alphas on the slide before, we demand that those obey polynomial accuracy constraints. So you can actually project those, those coefficients so that if the solution were smooth, that the equation is whatever order you want, that's actually a constraint that you can easily put in. And so we do that um, basically just for, it seems the right, like the right thing to do. And then actually in what I'm gonna show you, what we decided to do, and this is by no means I mean, you could do something different. What we decided to do was to only apply this to the convective flux because the U dot grad U term, because that's the Reynolds stress is the, is the game. So we're not gonna actually do this on the viscous term itself um, or the, we're only gonna go after the Reynolds stress and we are going to essentially, when you are interpolating you know, the, the node points right, on the, to get the fluxes, that is, that is basically where we're going to apply these algorithms. And then we just stick them into the equation of motion. We, we allow you to apply forces um, externally, um, and then and then um, you know project uh, off the the um, non-divergence-free part of the velocity field, and and that's the algorithm. So that's what we call learned discretizations. So another thing you could do though is you could do what one might call learned corrections. So what learned corrections does is it takes a standard algorithm, um, right? You, you know, some whatever update rule you get in like the numerical methods class that I once taught here, um, that must still exist, and you do that. And then what you do is you say, uh oh, I messed up, and you just add a correction. And you and and that and that correction can be a neural network. You can parameterize that, and that's a, that's a different way of proceeding. So the so both of these I think correspond to as little machine learning as I can imagine, where this is pure machine learning. And what I want to say is that at least to my knowledge, the mathematics of this field does not exist, and there is no a priori way of determining which of these methods is better. The only way that I know is to actually just run everything, which is actually one of the reasons that doing this at Google turned out to be particularly convenient. Um, there's a lot of compute in what I'm about to show you. <laughs> Maybe you guys, anyway, okay. So, so, okay, so I wanna just make one more comment before I, um, sorry, this is Zoom. Okay, so one comment. So when is a model better? Before we, you know, so, I, uh, the, the, so like in all seriousness, if you wanna use this, when is it better? So there are two things that we need. So we need accuracy. So I've already defined accuracy. The other thing that we really need to keep track of and again, this is a problem specific thing, but is generalizability because the original equations, you know, you can run them on anything. And so, and actually one of the things that I find problematic with the literature is that this is often ignored generalizability. And for example, my pet peeve, just to sort of get a pet peeve out there is that I can train on a flow and I can predict, and you know, the flow is seeded with some random number generator. 
And then I can generate new random numbers and I can try to predict on those and call that my prediction step. But the problem with that is that if that's the only thing you're doing, the dynamics in anything that's interesting is chaotic. And after a couple of Lyapunov times, you've reset the random number generator anyway. And so therefore it's not really a very strict test. So, and so, it, so I think it's, it is, if one wants to, I mean, m maybe this whole research program will fail, but if it is to succeed, then we need algorithms that generalize, I think that are better than that, if we want them to sort of end up in textbooks. And so, so, so we have, we spent a lot of time sort of puzzling over this and we have for turbulence, three different generalization tests. The first one is what I just told you, which I think is certainly a good check. If it, you can't even do that, you're dead basically. But it's, but then the sort of, then the, the high for is you change the forcing function. You should be able to do it for, you know, if you turn the forcing off, it should still work like that. That's another thing. And then the sort of harder one is to, to actually change the Reynolds number itself, which on one hand you might think is insane. But on the other hand, remember, we're only learning small scale interpolants and Kolmogorov did live and he taught us that there is a, that, that the Kolmogorov scale that is, does depend on Reynolds number in a, in a way, in a, in a concrete way. And if you, you know, increase the Reynolds number, then the scale goes down. And so that means that you should be able to take the model that you trained at one Reynolds number and apply it to another with some degradation. I mean, really you need to train on this, but like it's, it, it should still basically work. So that's the way that we designed this. And so we, and what I'm about to show you, we, this was the way that we did this. We had, um, so we we use oops, we use Kolmogorov flow as a um, as a um, we actually so two D turbulence is not three D turbulence is more interesting than two D but you can iterate much faster in two D so actually we've been doing this in three D which I can discuss at least say comment any comments about at the end um, but but the but the point is if you want to iterate quickly to experiment with algorithms you're much better off in two D so Kolmogorov flow is a canonical forcing that's of interest and the the so we would train on and then we would test on larger domains. Um, you know, changing the forcing, like turning it off and higher Reynolds numbers. And so, th and so that's the game. And so in order to do this, we wrote and have now open sourced a fully differentiable fluid solver in JAX. Um, so this is particularly convenient because it's a, it's a fluid mechanics code as we all grew up on, but it also is fully differentiable and it is sort of, e it runs efficiently on hardware accelerators, which basically lets you take advantage of parallelization and all of the amazing things that can be done. And so our current um, code uses a, um, uses a discretization scheme like this, where, um, you know, with between where velocities like live, you know, on face centers and pressures are in the middle of cells, but right, um, th th that's the current code. And it's a, this is like a little code, a little snippet of the code. It, it just, this is what runs, you, you know, and this will run in a collab quickly, basically. So, so, okay, so, and this is open source right now is Jack CFD, Jack Sash dash CFD if people are interested. So, okay, so now I wanna to explain to you the experiments that we did in this. So what we did was we took Kolmograph flow with Reynolds number of a thousand. Um, we then, found ground truth trajectories from a high resolution simulation, which was 2048 squared. Um, the, we're using an explicit Euler method um, just as a simple thing. And what we're doing is, is but we're, we're making the time step basically, that is as you increase the mesh spacing, you should also increase the time step to satisfy the Euler stability constraint. And so we just took CFL, you know, the CFL factor to be a half and Delta T increases with Delta X. So, um, so we, we take the, the ground truth um, simulation and we then downsample it to quarter, coarser grids with varying coarsening and we use that as training data. Um, when we train, we, um, we use 32 trajectories for training, each of which has different random initial seeds, which are unrolled for 4,800 time steps. The time step of course changes depending on the mesh spacing. Um, and, um, and then we, what we found was that in order for this to work, we just did an L2 loss over the, the trajectory, but we found that you might think that you would just do the next, you try to predict the next step, but that actually, it turns out, if you do that, at least in our hands, then you tend to create update rules which are unstable. But if you, if you um, roll out longer, then that um, gets rid of the instability. And then we do model evaluation. And actually kind of ironically, the most expensive part of this is model, model evaluation. And that is because we were paranoid about instabilities occurring in the update rules. And since there are no theorems to prove whether or not the update rule is stable or not, the, we basically just used tens of thousands of time steps in our evaluation steps to do this. And, and we required that they were stable over these long times. So that's the 
the basic setup. And now I will just show you some results. So this is, um, so this is an example of a result. So this is um, sort of, we're gonna compare, so this is the, the, the sort of the, um, the direct simulation at 2048 squared. This is time step zero, 500, 1000 and 1500. Um, this is a vorticity, this is the vorticity distribution. So the, the bottom um, shows the baseline. This is the same algorithm running at 64 squared, which is 32 times downsampled. Um, and the, um, the middle shows the learned interpolations. And, um, and what you'll notice is we've conveniently colored boxes here um, to show you like a structure of the flow so you can track it. And what you see is, is that the 64 squared baseline, 64 squared learned interpolation does much better um, than the baseline. So you see this visually. So, okay, so now let's be quantitative. Sorry, I need to move this thing. Um, okay, so, so to be quantitative, one sort of a simple way to be quantitative and to see how well you're doing actually with respect to upscaling is to plot the correlation of the velocity um, with respect to time relative to the baseline. So the baseline is this blue curve. It's the um, 2048 um, squared simulation. So it basically is perfectly correlated with itself. The 1024 squared simulation is this blue curve, you know, sort of falls off the 2048 at around this time. So this dashed line, vertical line, corresponds to three Lyapunov times. And so this is basically when chaos has taken over, which is the reason for this. And then these are different simulations with different baseline, the, the solid curves of the baselines. So this, for example, is 64 squared. So this is the learned interpolation with 64 squared. And what you see is that the learned interpolation um, with 64 squared um, basically matches, um, so it's 64 squared, it essentially matches the performance of a solution with a grid that is 10 times smaller. So this is therefore with 100 times fewer grid points, because this is two dimensions, this basically achieves the same performance. So this is, so this is you know, actually 10 times, so this method on this test set is 10 times upscaling. And also, so if you wanna to go to long times, which is also of interest, then you can't look at pointwise Riemann anymore because of, the, of chaos, but you can look at spectra. And this also holds with spectra. So, okay, so now you worry and say, but what about computational efficiency? Because we, because I told you, if this isn't efficient, then it's useless. Um, and so the, um, so, because we are having to pay for this through this neural network. So, okay, so we ran this on sort of the TPU V4 um, and, on this, one of the things that was true is that we is that by running this algorithm, so you know the limiting the limiting step in doing an update of a simulation like this is actually reading numbers in and out of memory, and so because of this, and, and the, the utilization fraction of the of the of the machines tends to be rather low, so there's a lot of compute that's just sitting there to use, and so we get for free basically a factor of ten. Um, of compute because we just you just do more calculations and it doesn't even notice. So um, so we had 12.5 times higher throughput flops on this code than on the baseline solver, and despite about um, about 150 times more aberrations, that meant that the ML solver is only 12 times slower. But we had a 10x upscaling. So a 10x upscaling in 2D corresponds to 10 cubed because it's 10 times 10 times the time step, which is another 10. So this is an 80 times an 80x raw speed up basically while maintaining the same performance. And we built this Pareto frontier, which to sort of illustrate this, that if you plot on solvers, um, the, um, the, you know, on solvers of different sizes, the runtime, this is the runtime per time unit on the Y axis. And this is the time until it decorrelates, right? You know, up to some amount, which is a which is a measure of accuracy. Then, you know, across a range of algorithms, the speed up um, that we reported in the paper is about 86x. Actually, since then, we realized that, that that there was actually a distribution, and we were extremely pessimistic, and that actually the average of the distribution is 150x. But anyway, that's just change. The um, the um, this is the main point, and so this is so. But of course, this was on the terrible generalization test because I already, I criticized this as a generalization test that is starting with different initial conditions. And I guess the short thing is, is we did this on lots of different situations, decaying turbulence, um, making the box bigger and saw the same phenomenon. So this is, um, this is decaying turbulence, same code that was trained on the other thing. And right, it still, um, you know, leads to, you know, roughly a 10 X upscaling. This is, um, and this is even higher Reynolds number, which is I think really kind of non-trivial. So what we did was, if you, if you increase the Reynolds number from 1,000 to 4,000, in 2D, the Kolmogorov scale scales like one over the square root of Reynolds number. So that means that the, the, the smallest scale should go down by a factor of two. So we simply took the model that we trained at Reynolds number 1,000, and we pretended that it was operating on a grid of half as big, 
same model, didn't change anything else. And then it also basically led to about 8x upscaling. Um, we, and we didn't do, I mean, in reality, what you should do is, 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 is there's going to be some Reynolds number dependence of this upscaling operation, but it's still, it wasn't enough to degrade performance that much. And this is the sort of same thing on a larger domain. So, okay, so I'm almost out of time and I want to sort of um, whatever. So we then, and this is where we really use the computational power at Google, um, is that we then repeated these tests on every update rule we could imagine. Because, so that's nice. But like, let's compare it to everything else you can imagine. So I told you there were, there's learned um, discretizations, which is what I just talked about. There's also the learned correction idea, um, which is the, another, and then you could use a pure machine learning model. And we used two types of pure machine learning models. We used a sort of standard ResNet, and we also used an encoder processor decoder, which is kind of popular in these days, which is just two different architectures. It doesn't, um, it doesn't really even matter. And we then ran all of the experiments that I just said, starting from, Different and um, random seeds in the in the eval set on on um, or on training actually on all of these on all of these things and we and we in this paper we have this sort of hard to read plot about performance but I just want to walk through the main point so this is the pointwise accuracy metric this is the statistical accuracy metric and this is the stability of the rollout that is well whether the code actually blows up so one means stable less than one means that it blows up. This is the proportion that are stable, basically. The proportion of the models that you train for each type that are, that are stable. So the blue dots, this first thing is learned interpolations. This is learned corrections. And these two are different machine learning architectures. And then this is on the different problems. So forced turbulence, larger domain, decaying turbulence, um, you, you know, higher Reynolds number. And what you see actually, so better, accuracy is better when it's, so accuracy, this is 10x speed up, this is 8x speed up. So what you see is, it's interesting, if you look here, so this green, this is an, an encoder processor decoder architecture, which is pure machine learning model. It actually does quite, it does the same actually as the, um, as the physics models at, um, on this test. And it also does the same when you make the domain larger. It, uh, however, it does worse when you try it on something different. Um, which I, I mean, to me, that, that kind of is consistent with my worldview. That that's what should happen. But it's interesting, actually. It's not that a pure model is bad. It's just that you're losing generalization. And I mean, I, th and, and I mean, but this sort of, I think, hints at, and this this conclusion is true across metrics. So um, it, it kind of hints at, you, you know, with a question, which is, you know, again, how much machine learning should we actually use? So. This can be used on other equations, just to throw just a random example, which is uh, I at least find entertaining. So I mentioned Eddie viscosity model. So you know people invent effective formulas for viscosities and put those and, and run those. And so we just took a standard Eddie viscosity model and trained on that, and the same phenomenon occurs. I mean, you you can also speed up. So the Eddie viscosity model, of course, is itself an approximation, which is why this is at Reynolds number a thousand. You know, um, but but it, it speeds up the you know if, if this is what you believe then this method will speed it up. So, um, and so this seems to be pretty general. So, okay, so um, I'm almost done. This is my last two slides. So scaling and outlook. So we're still in the early days of this, but it's kind of reasonable to extrapolate. So what, the, what we're interested in is the runtime of the code as a function of the number of grid points, basically. And the, um, the, um, th there's a sort of canonical scaling for an explicit method, which the runtime scales like n to the d plus one. So K here is the coarse graining factor. It's how much coarser of a grid can you run the code at while maintaining resolution. So this is the factor that I reported as 10 in what we, what we did so far. Um, there are then prefactors of the scaling law. So there's a the sort of standard prefactor, which is the, from standard numerical analysis, like this is how much it costs to run the sort of standard physics model. But then we have an extra prefactor because we're, we're paying for these damn interpolants. Um, and so this is the cost of machine learning per grid point. So right now in our hands, this ratio is about 12. Um, so I should say we absolutely we made absolutely no effort to improve this, like not at all. We just got this to work. And historically in machine learning, it has been possible to push these, these numbers down. Um, so there is no reason to think that this 10x, this factor 10x that, that we found with this is sort of how little, the way I think about it is it's kind of, so you have the Kolmogorov scale, if you learn what the smallest structures look like over their distribution, how little resolution can you get before you find out 
what's happening. So there is a, a famous LES model that, I mean, for, this is for aficionados. So there's a famous LES model, which was written down by Dale Pullen from Caltech, which basically thinks about the small scales by imagining that there's a vortex in a grid box and that you're not resolving it. And he then basically, and so you're not resolving it. And then what he does is he averages the stress from an actual vortex solution of the Navier Stokes equations over all orientations. And he derives a stress model. So it's kind of true that what we're doing is we're saying, oh, the vortex is pointing this way. And then we're using, and then we're using that. And the factor of 10 seems to be empirically um, what is needed for that. Actually, did I go back? This, this might have automatically. So um, here, wait, sorry, I want to. Um, so, um, right, so what I wanted to say is if we just assume the factor of 10 generalizes, then in 3D, this would, so in 2D, remember I told you there was a factor of about 100 speed up. In 3D, you get a factor of 10 above that, so it's a factor of 1,000. And so a factor of 1,000 does not solve the problem that I laid out at the beginning, namely that we will never be able to compute anything that we want to. On the other hand, I don't think we should laugh at factors of 1,000. So a factor of 1,000 corresponds to n years where n is bigger than 1 by a, a lot of Moore's law. So it's not, this is not a terrible thing. So every factor of 1,000 helps. OK, so, um, so, okay, so just to summarize, this is my last slide. Um, um, so the solutions of PDEs sweep out a low dimensional manifold. And the idea is, of this talk was to learn the manifold really with as little machine learning as possible. So the, I think what's interesting about this is that this trade-off space is different than classical numerical analysis. Um, I mean, here, basically, what we're doing is we're spending compute on the algorithm development. And then we're, once you have it, then you can just use it. And of course, we're also losing generalizability. Um, and um, so let's see, turbulence and beyond. So I'm very excited about the use of differentiable codes for discovering things in general. I just, to me, the most exciting thing about machine learning and physics and science, or machine learning and physics, let's just say it this way, is, is, is not the use of machine learning, which I don't actually, I'm not sure if I can say this here. I'm not sure I care that much about. Um, but I do find the tools that were developed to be extremely interesting and useful for solving problems that we never could even dream of. Like the idea of optimizing a numerical method as an optimization problem is not something that even a decade ago, at least I think, I mean, we could have done it basically. We could have written the code, but it would have taken, right? You, you, that is, the problem is, is that it would have taken you know, an entire graduate student roughly to write the initial version of the code and then you wouldn't have been able to iterate on it. Whereas now, because of these sort of machine learning frameworks, you know, as soon as you learn how to use them, you can experiment like crazy and find things that are good quickly. So, and I think there's also opportunity for learning physics. So anyway, I'll just leave it at that. And, um, and so maybe that's it. And I will end by putting up the people who did this work. I basically really want to acknowledge Stefan, Dima and Jamie who wrote the code and did the research on this turbulence thing, which was really an engineering. Well, is anyway. It, this was an. I mean, in my view, this was a um, major thing. So, thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we have some time for questions. We are going to start maybe with people here, and then we can check the chat. So, uh, have a question. The mic and your question. Thank you. Um, Thank you. That was very, very interesting. Um, I have a question. So you still always seem to require a ground truth. So a simulation that's obtained by doing the, the exact Reynolds number that, you're, that you want to do, uh, you know, sort of with conventional methods. But you motivated this with, you know, our wish to do simulations of Reynolds numbers that are basically so large they want to even fit them. Right. Um, so good. I guess that's my first. Okay, that's a good question. Okay, so that's very good. So, okay, so what I would say is we don't, so I actually showed this example of using the code that was trained on Reynolds number 1000 and running it at Reynolds number 4000, where we actually could generate the ground truth and it worked there as well. So the point is that the thing I would say is we do know a lot about turbulence. Like we, so we know that there, I mean, or at least we believe, I actually believe despite my skepticism of whatever, I do believe, and I actually think this is generally true of PDEs that, you know, as you send a parameter to infinity, there, there are going to be regularities that one can uncover. I mean, this is essentially what applied mathematics has been doing for the last century. And, and we can use those regularities to try to extrapolate if we do it intelligently. 
And so I agree with you, though, that the real goal, and this is what, something that we're trying to do, is to basically take this and on 3D turbulence, for example, run it at a Reynolds number, which is impossible. To, and then, but then, of course, you have a problem. Then if I got up and showed you that, you would say, but how do you know it's right? And my only evidence would be that, well, here's all the work that I did to get here, and here are all the metrics that I have. And, and we're, that's what we're going to have. And I guess I, I don't know what to do about that, actually. If you have thoughts, I would be very interested. But I do think, though, that this is rational, right? Like, it could be wrong, just like anything. Like, I mean, you could discover something that's wrong, but that's what science is. So, I, so but, I, but I, I do think one can extrapolate, and I yeah. think that it's a... Um, so, so it's not like I have a, a yeah. better solution. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm quite familiar with examples where transition to different behavior yeah. actually happens at rather large Reynolds yeah. numbers yeah. that you think right. should be asymptotic right. enough and in we're, fact are not. But, but what I would say about that though is we're being, I believe we're being fairly unambitious here in that we are only learning those transitions that you're talking about, at least the ones that I'm aware of, do not happen at the Kolmogorov scale. They're at a larger scale. And we are only learning, this is why I said this was the goal was to use as little machine learning as possible because I only want to learn the smallest possible, you, you, you know, and then, and then one would hope that the emergent behavior would still come out of it. That was correct. That would be the hope. But like, I think whether or not that, to, to what extent one can push that, you know, is the question. Thank so, you. Let's try to maybe move to the chat to get, yeah. maybe uh, Michael, you can take a look, you can take a look oh, here. Sure. Uh, yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, oh, Q and A. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Q and A here. Uh, yeah. So oh, we, okay. let, let's take a few from the chat. Oh, somebody took my class. Wow, that's really great. Oh, that was impression. See, I did teach that. It was probably. I'm, I'm glad you remember it. Well, I don't. I remember being petrified. That's different. How does training guarantee numerical stability? That's a good question, Roth. How does training guarantee numerical stability? I mean, so. In general, what we found was that if we did rollouts, like what we wanted to do was to only to take the update rule, to roll it out one step and to train on one step. And when you do that, it turns out that it's unstable in our hands. So in order to solve stability, we, what we found, and this is purely empirical, is that by training on many steps, and in what I just showed you, we used 32. So we created a loss, which was the next 32 steps, and then you create an error which is you know, the sum of the square of the errors over those 32 steps. I mean, it couldn't be more kludgy in a way. Then when we trained on that, then it, 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 with the instabilities went away. And I, what I think is, is that there's a real need. I mean, if this way of doing things is useful, there is a real need for there to be mathematics. That is, we need to understand this stuff better because this is, that's not, I mean, I'm not totally comforted by that, but on the other hand, that's where we are. that you were first. Um, I was going to ask this anyway, but it, it ties into um, the first question that was um, posed. Um, did you try exploring RNNs? Because when it comes to um, time-based or temporal yeah. um, data, they do perform well. And I, I feel like I know the answer to it, which is computational expensiveness. But I, I, I have tried. Um, looking at trajectories and comparing CNNs and RNNs. And I observed that like certain um, like repeti repetitive behaviors are kind of like um, characterized much better by an RNN. Yeah, so, yeah. so I think that's a really yeah. good question. So the question is basically, is it, I mean, so I'll, I'll generalize RNNs. I mean, so an RNN, if you're doing something in time, should we be learning in time? We're only learning in space. We're only learning interpolation in space. You could also learn interpolation in time. And that seems totally sensible. And actually, so we haven't done that, but it's not because it's too expensive. It's just because we haven't done that. That's the only reason. Um, I, I don't, um, I, I think it's an interesting. It, it, it's a new problem. You haven't seen yeah, well, it's a, well, I mean, clearly, you, you know, we're interested in the space time rollouts of equations. And so we should be learning on the temporal patterns. And I am um, as well. And we're just not doing, we're not doing that in any way in what I've just shown you. But on the other hand, I kind of feel that the fact that this seems to be working. So there's a trade-off space. You also alluded to this. There is. The, the, so the only reason I'm worried about the computational expense actually is because, at the end, these methods, right? This Pareto frontier that I showed. That's the way these things have to be judged. You have to ask, was it worth it? At least for what we're doing here, you have to ask, was it worth it for the compute time? If it's not worth it for the compute time, it's a waste, and you shouldn't do it, basically, right? And Unless so it's life or death. 
Yeah, and so the um, and so that for that you need you know the more expensive the thing you you have to gain basically. Yeah. Um, which order we know? I actually don't remember. I'm embarrassed. I think it's oh, Ruben. Hi, Ruben. Also, you probably I think cannot include the physics. I'm not sure about it. But Say again. With an RN, and you probably cannot include the physics. You can what the physics? The, include the physics. You, you could. About I, okay, so I haven't thought. But I, there may be ways you can do this that are. I, I just told you everything I know. So, Ruben, I believe it was fourth order, but I forgot. It's nice to see you, even though I don't see you. Should I keep going? Um, yeah, so it's it's already past one. Okay. So anyone who has to leave can leave, but we can stay if Michael, you're okay with that. We can stay here a few more minutes and because there are a few more questions. And so yeah, let's let's go to the next one in the chat. I think that uh, yeah. is the when you compute high resolutions. Yeah. So PDFs. Yeah, yeah. So problems. this is a very good question. So in what in so the the examples that I've shown you all have periodic boundary conditions. Ha ha ha. Um, so um, so the um, so. Um, so that's one answer. We just use this periodic boundary conditions on a smaller domain. Now, the justification for that, though, is that we're trying to figure out essentially open solutions, you know, away from walls and what I'm describing. And um, and there, um, you, you know, we're learning local rules. And you, you would say that if you have a bunch of, it shouldn't depend on how many eddies there are in the box. It should just depend on the structure of the eddies. And so I think that, so that's the justification for doing that. So the more, an interesting question is, is how does one deal with actual boundary conditions? And that's something that we're working on. It's interesting. Okay, any more questions here? Yeah. Hey, um, in your quest for the fastest solver, uh, when do we need to consider the training times of neural networks? Because I see us mostly considering the inference times. Um, well, the question is, when do you need to consider the training times? Well, I mean, if you can make an algorithm that speeds up you know, codes by a factor of a thousand, it's worth a hell of a lot, isn't it? Because you just, if everyone can use it, then you're just, you, the amortization is incredible. So I, we're not worried about training times. I don't know if that's the right answer, but I, I would be willing, I mean, like you have to be able to compute it. If you can't compute it, then like you can't do it. But I would have argued that if you could do this, it, it could be quite, I mean, imagine there were some webs, you know, instead of all these, you know, image neural networks, you went for your algorithm for your PDE and you just downloaded it and then you, and you were confident in it, you ran on it, then I don't know if every, you, you know what I mean? Like, it, you, of course the question is, how do you gain confidence? But if you were confident, then that would be worth it. I would, I mean, obviously that's the hypothesis. So I, I don't know if that's true, but that's our hypothesis. Okay, thanks. Uh, oh, I was just curious. So yeah, I guess in, in this situation, it seems like you're pretty interested in like tracking, you know, you want to predict where every eddy is. It's kind of like the initial yeah. value problem. I guess I'm coming from it like, you know, weather prediction versus climate yeah. prediction. This seems more like weather prediction. Yeah. You care where the storms are. Yeah. Would you use the same approach if you yeah. care about good. So climate I alluded, prediction or yeah, study? Yeah, that's a really business. good question. So I kind of alluded to this in, so I made this comment at some point that, you know, the loss function could be anything. I mean, it was a choice to say that we're trying to predict the, the averaging of space. You could also average over time. You could average over time and space. So I think that there's a lot of flexibility. And I, one of the things that we're really interested, for example, which I think it gets it, we're very interested in what you just said, um, but, the, but one of them is, is, is just how would one train reasonable probabilistic models, for example, right? That, that um, I mean, th th this thing on long times does give Kolmogorov back, which I don't think is a surprise. I mean, so does everything else. You, you know, it's kind of sensible. But a more interesting question, I think, is what you're asking, which is how to do it efficiently and are there ways to do it efficiently? And we've been thinking about this lately. Um, Let's take the last question in the chat, and I think that we can wrap up with this. That I think it's about if you have tried like an isotropic inhomogeneous flows. And if this would work in that case, yeah. So we have done some work on isotropic, and, and it's, so there's there's over there are two different things. There's open flows and there's flows with boundaries. We've worked on both, um, and um, the um, and we don't. I mean, so far at least in our hands, it's it's working. You know, on the other hand, I didn't have a picture in my talk, so that's where we are. Okay. Well, Michael, thanks a lot for this uh, if we talk. So. And then we have our next seminar. I don't remember currently, November 4th. So I'll see you here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.